So uh, I'm Dan Water, and I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist. Uh, most of my work focuses on sex therapy, and that's uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. It's really great to have you. It's my pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> um, I've loved working with you um, in the little bit that we have. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Definitely respect your work. Um, you. Let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? Where do you live now? What are you doing? So uh, that's kind of a short story because <laughs> where I'm from is where I live now. Okay. Is in, uh, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've been practicing. I grew up, I was born and raised there. I've been practicing psychology there for uh, over 35 years. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so. And so you're in private practice? I'm in a, a group private practice. Mm -hmm. There are uh, 18 of us uh, in the group. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a multi-specialty group. So we don't all do the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of my practice, as I said before, focuses on sexual issues, um, everything from sexual dysfunction uh, to the evaluation of sex offenders. Mm -hmm. um, and a big part of what I do actually over the last 15 or so years is I do a lot of work for the uh, licensing boards. Mm. So a lot of uh, a lot of licensees uh, from the medical board, the board of psychological examiners, social workers, counselors, dentists, who end up uh, sort of crossing sexual boundaries with patients. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I do a lot of evaluation um, and and treatment uh, of them. Wow. So yeah, that's taken up a lot of my time. So we talked a little bit about this before, but how did you get into what you do? So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a funny story. You know, I was uh, uh, doing an, uh, just a general internship in a family counseling agency in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Mm -hmm. This was back in, uh, gosh, the late 70s. And uh, they would get, you know, people coming in with problems with sexual function or sexual questions, sexual yeah. identity, whatever it might be. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, they really didn't know what to do with them. There was very little training back in those days. And so the folks in Alabama figured, well, since I'm from the Northeast, you know, I've probably heard everything, so <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll give them to me. <laughs> so so that, that's kind of how I started. That's funny. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I quickly realized I didn't have, you know, much training in mm -hmm. sex therapy um, myself. So uh, as I continued on in my studies, I, I went for specialty training in, uh, in sex therapy. So I do want to hear more about that. How did you sort of build into what you do now? I definitely want to talk about what you do now in more uh -huh. detail, but how did you sort of flesh out your education, your specialty training? Well, what so I, I, I was really very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and I know some people might not call it luck, but I, I think I've been lucky. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I really do. I, I, I found a, uh, my doctoral program had a, a, a sex therapy specialty track mm -hmm. at, uh, at NYU. Uh, and so I, I went there and, and really the, uh, the, the advice that I had gotten was to not do that, you know, mm -hmm. because back in those days, you know, the idea of specializing seemed to be too limiting. You know, mm -hmm. it was, you're going to limit yourself. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's just not, it's not going to be easy to build a practice that way. Nothing could have been further from the truth. We um, still hear that sometimes today. Still some, yeah, you yeah. still hear people say people that say today. That, yeah. But it, you know, especially for an area uh, where there really is a need, you know, mm -hmm. like sex therapy. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, it was, I think, a very good decision, mm -hmm. you know, to, to specialize. Mm -hmm. Then I, I was able to do some really nice training after that. I did training with Albert Ellis uh, uh, postdoctorally at the Institute for Rational Emotive Therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people do, you know, always recognize him for RET and, or mm -hmm. REBT now or mm -hmm. CBT. Um, but he was one of the early sex therapists. Really? Yes, yes. He was one of the, the founders of uh, a couple of the really big sex therapy uh, professional organizations. That's so I learned a lot there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just, you know, just just managed to, to, to build a, a, a nice referral-based practice. Most of my uh, patients would come to me through... Uh, mostly urology, uh, mm -hmm. but also OBGYN, mm -hmm. psychiatry, mm -hmm. family practice. I mean, you know, people were talking to all of their doctors about their sexual difficulties. Yeah. So, uh, so that's kind of how I got started uh, on on that. And what kept you going in it? It's interesting, right? Sex therapy yep. is interesting. Very what interesting. What is it that sort of kept you in, interested in it? Well, you know, it's 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 interesting, but it's also very challenging. Yeah. And it, it's also one of those areas that there's so much room for debate. You know, mm -hmm. our, our, 
e even today, what we assume to be correct about sexuality and sexual functioning changes all the time. Yes. I mean, just it's so much more complex mm -hmm. than than we ever realized mm -hmm. and you know the idea of helping people sort of find their way through that complexity mm -hmm. is 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 just always been a challenge that i mm -hmm. i i just I, I find so gratifying mm -hmm. um so it it has not been hard to stay interested yeah. and active because it's really a lot more varied than, than it might sound. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of lecturing. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of writing too, mm -hmm. which I, which I enjoy, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've published several book chapters and articles and, mm -hmm. you know, so that's another piece of it. It's, it's just, there's so much to do. It's, yeah. it's, it's not boring. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine not. Not at all. So <clears> we <throat> do a lot of trauma work here at All Points North, um, mm -hmm. sort of one of the cornerstone foundations of our treatment model. And I know that you have done a lot of work on um, looking at non-sexual trauma or sexual trauma and sexual mm -hmm. addiction issues, sex issues. Right. Um, right. Tell me a little bit about that, that connection and sort of... So, yeah, so, you know, that, that's been... Part of what's made my work so interesting in the last, you know, 10 or 12 years mm -hmm. is, you know, I was trained to do sex therapy the very traditional way, you know, mm -hmm. and, and sex therapy was always, and still today, is predominantly a sort of, you know, behavioral, symptom-focused mm -hmm. uh, approach to treatment. You know, mm -hmm. that someone comes in with a particular symptom, um, uh, erection problems, orgasm problems, yep. desire problem, whatever it may be. Yep. And you try and target that symptom and, uh, you know, a series of behavioral exercises, some cognitive behavioral work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, you know, but there were parts of that that never really resonated mm -hmm. for me, you know. Uh, there are some people for whom that works just great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there were so many people who I would see who would get better, but then they would come back. Mm -hmm. You know, the problems would return or they might mm -hmm. come out in some other ways. Mm -hmm. And so I started really thinking a little bit more um, about what the, the dysfunction or the problem really means to the person who's experiencing it. And, mm -hmm. and there was a, more of a movement, I guess, towards more depth-oriented therapy. So, yeah. so as I said earlier in my career, I, I studied with Albert Ellis. Yeah. Later on, it was Irvin Yalom and the existential yeah. approach to therapy. And, and that, that just took me you know, by storm. It, it was, it was career changing. It was life changing. Game changing. Ga yeah. Absolutely yep. game changing. Really so cool. what I started to think about more was, you know, well, I mean, I'll give you an example. So, so one of the things that they typically would teach in sex therapy is that for men with erection problems, for example, mm -hmm. that the problem was performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very common, mm -hmm. you know, kind of explanation that, you know, the man uh, has problems with erections and then he starts worrying about it and that anxiety makes then it keeps it, make, it makes it worse and keeps it a problem, which is, it is a factor. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying it's not a factor, but it never really sat well with me that that was really a causative factor because most of the people that I see have a good history of sexual functioning with the person they're with. Mm -hmm. They've been together for a long time. Mm -hmm. Sex was fine. Mm -hmm. And then something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And to me, the idea that, so why would you be so anxious about performing with this person that you've had a good history with and, 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 you know, really sort of a good amount of time, you know, yeah. it just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. So I, I started to think about looking more carefully at the timeline, you know, when these things started, mm -hmm. how they looked when they presented mm -hmm. and taking more of a developmental history, a developmental life history, as opposed to sex history specifically. And what I started to see more and more of was that a lot of times these sexual shutdowns, these changes, were really the result of something that was being triggered from much earlier on in their lives. And I say non-sexual trauma because there's a lot written about sexual trauma. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's not hard to figure out why someone who's been sexually abused or sexually assaulted or sexually traumatized might have difficulties with, with sex. Yes. You know, it's, it's not hard to, to, to understand that part of it. Right. But most of the people that I see mm -hmm. have not had sexual trauma. I mean, mm -hmm. some have, mm -hmm. but many have not had sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. They have no idea why they're having problems. Mm -hmm. So one of the very common presentations that, that I see, and, and I'll stay with just the example of male mm -hmm. uh, erectile dysfunction. Sure. 
because it's so common, is that is is that when relationships are casual, they seem to have no trouble. Mm. But then what you would often see is this relationship deepening event occurs. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I hear couples all the time say, you know, the sex was great and then we got married and mm -hmm. then we didn't have sex anymore. Mm -hmm. or it was great and then we got engaged or we had a baby or whatever it mm -hmm. might what mm -hmm. this sort of relationship deepening trauma mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sorry relationship deepening experience which could be that, traumatic. which could be traumatic <laughs> but I think it really triggers trauma yeah and the kind of trauma it tends to trigger are the non-sexual traumas like attachment problems yeah. you know these are people who have had issues in their past about abandonment and loss or suffocation and engulfment and so what happens is is the relationship deepens it sets off this this panic yeah. right and what that what happens then i think is you know i i, I always look at the unconscious as really a, a protector you know it, it it it's the the way i conceptualize the unconscious is it tries to protect you from pain Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that it often protects people from pain, mm -hmm. the pain of abandonment, the pain of loss, etc., is by set, shutting them down sexually so that they don't get too deeply involved or too, too far involved, you know. And so as they get married or whatever it may be, as they, they formalize their relationship, they start to worry more about what's going to happen if this person leaves me. They start to worry more about, am I going to lose my autonomy? Am I going to end up suffocating, uh, being suffocated or something like that? Yeah. And then what happens is their, in, in the case of male erectile dysfunction, you know, their penis kind of speaks for them. Yeah. It's, it's the unconscious voice yeah. that then is kind of cool. shutting you down. And saying, That's right. Saying, look, <laughs> you know out. what? We're not, we're not going here. Mm. We're not going here. Um, and, and I see this a lot and then working with, with these people and sort of trying to get them to see how this may be related, mm -hmm. uh, to some earlier trauma. Mm -hmm. You can, you can see it in their eyes. Yeah. It, it, it resonates, it strikes them. You can see it in their eyes and you just know you're on the right track. And then the therapy, as opposed to just focusing on symptom correction, really starts to look more at trauma uh tra it's trauma work trauma you know? therapy yeah it's trauma therapy it's so interesting because we see this so often in trauma therapy and trauma work how those <coughs> symptoms you know come out in life when something is triggered something is activated we see it everywhere mm -hmm. else it of course it would make sense that it would happen in their right. sexual lives too and there's such an intimacy component well that's that's where people often feel the most vulnerable yeah you know and so yeah it it, it, it it's sort of the perfect arena yeah. You know, for that. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, you know, they don't even recognize the things that have happened to them as traumatic. Right. You know, because they're the, the, the little T traumas, you know, mm -hmm. it's not the relational trauma, the relational trauma. It really, it, it, yeah. I mean, yes, we conceptualize it as little T, but, and, you know, like my friend Ryan Suave always says, mm -hmm. if you, you know, you s s put some sandpaper on a wall for long enough and you have the same hole that you would if you hit it with a sledgehammer. Yeah. yeah. So little T can really turn into <laughs> That's big right. big That's T. That's right. The bottom line is not all that different. Yeah. 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 And so so what I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, tomorrow, though, mm -hmm. is, is a little different, mm -hmm. is that it's kind of the, the other end of the spectrum, which is more what are sometimes called the sexual addictions. Yeah. And I have seen, uh, I've, I've collected now about somewhere around 50 cases, I guess, of people, mostly men, some women, mm -hmm. who uh, their, their sexual behavior has really kind of spiraled out of control in a very uncharacteristic way mm -hmm. following a confrontation with mortality. Wow. Mm -hmm. And this, th you know, th these are often people who have had early traumas of early parental loss, mm -hmm. uh, early deaths, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when they have a confrontation with mortality uh, that brings it close to them in their adult lives, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the existential thinking is that sex is sort of the antidote for death anxiety, yeah. Seth, the sex, the life force, etc. Yeah. And so they very often just spiral in uncontrolled ways into the success of sexual acting out. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Interesting. Do you see, um, do you see, and, and just briefly, because we only have a few more minutes, but mm -hmm. do you see sex addiction as an addiction? You yeah. know, so I, the, probably the best way I can, because that is, that is a huge 
uh, debate in the sex there. <laughs> I guess it's not a good question days. for a few minutes. You know, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, it, well, but my answer is is kind of short. You know, is that what the, I do not look at what we call sexual addiction as a a singular phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I think, because I have seen some people who do very, very well with traditional addiction-oriented 12-step model mm -hmm, programs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've seen others who didn't do well with that. I've seen mm -hmm. some who respond really well to more trauma-related therapies. I've mm -hmm. seen others who didn't do so well. So mm -hmm. I actually think that, that uh, and again, this was my criticism of sex therapy in the early days, mm -hmm. is that by focusing on the behavior uh, as opposed to what's driving the behavior, mm -hmm. it's a very difficult way to know which therapy is going to work best yeah so i don't argue with the term sex addiction the mm -hmm. people who come to see me they almost always use that term mm -hmm. uh, a lot of professionals who i respect highly mm -hmm. use that term mm -hmm. um so do i think it's an addiction maybe it is for some people but i don't think it is for everybody yeah I, makes sense well thank you so much my pleasure it's really thank nice you nice to have you my pleasure thanks, thanks.